A lean, middle-aged white man with bleach-blonde hair swaggers with cerebral palsy into a building entrance with an electric door. In 2011, the Ed Roberts campus opened in Berkeley, California, named after one of the founders of the independent living movement, a now worldwide movement of disabled people working for equal opportunity, self-determination, and respect. Here at the Ed Roberts campus, accessibility is not an afterthought. It's built in, everything from the architecture to the tenants here in the building, advocacy groups, nonprofits, the supports and services. Lawrence Carter Long, the communications director at Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, walks up a large red spiraling ramp, the focus of the entryway of the Ed Roberts campus. A person in a wheelchair speeds down the ramp, past a photo mural of the 504 sit-in. The building's design creates a statement about universal design, equal opportunity, and inclusion. Disability rights are a part of civil rights history, but in order for that to be understood by the masses, we've got to get behind it in the ways that people have fought to include other things. Archival footage of iconic civil rights protests. A protest sign reads, We shall overcome. Race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexuality. People had to claw and scratch and fight and protest and pass legislation in order for those things to get recognized as valid. Let's walk through some of those significant moments in disability history. 1909. Let's talk a bit about the dark history of eugenics. For most of human history, disability has been a diagnosis, something to be cured, fixed, and cut out. Across the United States, from 1909 through the 1970s, disabled women, disabled men, were put into institutions, were sterilized against their will and often without their knowledge. The words that were used, feeble-minded, idiot, moron, they were all meant to segregate and separate. The reverberations of that continue to play out now, a hundred years later. 1935. If you hear the word sit-in, you're likely to think about the American South, the civil rights protests of African Americans. But decades before, in Eastern cities like New York City, Manhattan, groups like the League of the Physically Handicapped were sitting in for their right to work. After the Great Depression, 1935, everybody was hit hard. People with disabilities were specifically excluded from projects from the Works Progress Administration under the FDR administration. People with disabilities who had met at a recreational center in New York City said, wait a minute, why should we settle for second class status? And the day they sat down to meet, the sit-in began. One of the first recorded sit-ins in United States history. So why did it take a disabled historian, someone like Paul Longmore, to uncover this fact Decades later, this should be taught alongside the Freedom Riders, alongside Stonewall. This is one of those moments where people said, we're going to demand access to the same things that everybody else gets to take for granted, and yet people don't know about it. Spring of 1977, disability rights activists in San Francisco and across the United States gathered to push, rally, and protest to make sure that regulations enacting Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act be put into law. Let's set the stage. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 prohibits discrimination due to disability in any programs, agencies, or by contractors receiving federal financial support. Going on three years later, but the regulations in order to enforce that law still have not been signed by Jimmy Carter. People with disabilities said, we want access to the things that other people are taking for granted. Federal buildings, education, employment initiatives. Demonstrations took place all across the nation. In San Francisco, about 150 people, led by Judy Human, occupied the health, education, and welfare building archival footage of protesters occupying the Hue headquarters. 
People came together in the community. There was intersectionality before the word existed. We had support from churches, unions, civil rights organizations, gay groups, elected politicians. We had the Gray Panthers offering support. We had the Black Panthers providing food. 28 days later, 504 was finally signed. Kitty Cohn giving 504 victory speech. We show strength and courage and power and commitment that we the shut-in or the shut-out, we the hidden, supposedly the frail and the weak, mm-hmm. that we could wage a struggle at the highest level of government and win. Mm-hmm. Here we are over four decades later, and that's still the longest sit-in, the longest occupation of any federal building recorded in the United States of America. Why aren't we using that as an example to say, this is what happens when communities come together? These are the changes that can occur when we stand together, roll together, sit together in solidarity. 1990. Nearly a decade after Section 504 protests, the stage was set to take it to the next level. Organizers such as Justin Dart and Yoshiko Dart met with activists in every state, rallying, organizing, protesting, ready to create what would become our own landmark civil rights legislation, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Over 30,000 activists across the nation attended forums and gave testimonies to draw attention to the discrimination disabled people in America still faced, hoping to push Congress to approve the ADA. Archival footage of protesters outside the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Congressman Major Owens and Justin Dart address the crowd. We are here today representing 43 million Americans with disabilities forced by massive discrimination to be this nation's most isolated, unemployed, impoverished, and welfare-dependent minority. As discriminatory barriers are eliminated, citizens with disabilities in America and in all nations will become producers, taxpayers, consumers, and participants in the full richness of their cultures. The power now is in the hands of the people here on this hill. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. What did it take to pass that law? Disability being disruptive. Washington, D.C., they climb out of their wheelchairs and they crawl up the steps of the United States Capitol. Footage of eight-year-old Jennifer Keelan Chaffins crawling up the stairs. A symbolic illustration of the obstacles that have been in our way for decades. Making that visceral, making that clear. We won't be left behind any longer. 2007. The Americans with Disabilities Act was the template the backbone for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at the United Nations. In March 2007, a record number of 161 signatories signed on, the largest number ever in the UN's history. But ironically, the CRPD hasn't been ratified here in the United States. So clearly, there's a lot of work yet to do. From small local efforts organized by many people collectively, disabled people have worked together across the United States to demand the right to education, employment, and housing. 
This community effort began decades ago and must continue today because although we have won some legal rights, there is still much discrimination. We need disability to be seen as a valuable part of diversity, and we need general public respect to ensure that we can live independent, full lives. We've waited long enough. The time to be included, the time for this to change, is now. And you can be a part of it. You should be a part of it. Where are you in your journey to inclusion? For more information, go to disabilityphilanthropy.org and promote using the hashtag DisabilityInclusion. Brought to you by the President's Council on Disability Inclusion in Philanthropy. Text on screen of the production credits. For a full credit list, please review the transcript file.